Bronzeville community. And in April, we'll be focusing on uh, Washington Park. So I wanna say good evening to everyone. Uh, hold on one second, I need to do one thing. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we have four items on our agenda today. One is uh, on Renaissance Bronzeville. The second one is on the Parkway Ballroom. Uh, the third one is um, a business idea that's being put forward for a cannabis related facility on 51st Street. And the fourth one is a presentation by QCDC, which is a local um, development organization in the community. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we will respond to them as uh, uh, you know, they come up. And uh, we'll get started with um, Bronzeville Renaissance. OK, so as some of you know, uh, there was a incident of a uh, public safety incident that happened at the Bronzeville Renaissance earlier this year. And um, I've asked the uh, commander of the second district, Commander Joshua Wallace, to join us this evening to give us some information about one, what happened, uh, two, the police department's response to the incident and uh, steps um, that he has taken going forward. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Commander uh, Joshua Wallace. Hi, Commander. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so in November of 2021, uh, there was an incident at uh, Bronzeville Renaissance in which there was a, a party uh, that was being thrown. Um, we were told it was not the, the, the usual crowd that, that go, um, partakes at the uh, Renaissance. However, um, security uh, overlooked or didn't catch that a firearm was brought into the, uh, to the, the venue. Uh, an argument ensued inside the venue. Uh, a firearm was brandished. It was uh, discharged, striking uh, an individual in the, in the venue. And then uh, there was an individual struck outside the venue. So when uh, licensed businesses have incidents of that nature, um, we can, uh, the superintendent of police can authorize what's called a summary closure. During that summary closure, uh, the uh, licensee uh, meets with myself. Well, first of all, they, they meet with corporation counsel because corporation counsel is is the law basically the, the attorney for the city of Chicago. So they meet with corporation counsel and they're advised of the steps they need to take. Uh, also uh, the Chicago Police Department's uh, vice unit, as well as the, um, the licensing uh, department for the city of Chicago. And during this process, we bring out the building department to do a full inspection of the uh, facility to see uh, if there are any things uh, that are out of code. So that's one thing that has to be done before they open. And then secondly, before they can open, they must um, agree to a nuisance abatement plan that meets certain specifications that will be agreed upon by the city of Chicago, the law department and the licensee. So, uh, I know uh, there are a lot of a lot of people wanted just to see the Renaissance closed and, and it go about its business. Uh, however, uh, being a licensee with the city of Chicago, you're afforded certain opportunities and rights. So rev uh, the revocation of a business license is a court matter. 
so it's something that has you have to go through in court. Um, there are hearings, testimonies, depositions uh, in order to determine whether or not um, the licensee meets uh, all the terms for revocation. However, uh, one thing that the law department has uh, advised uh, the, the police department is that if you go strictly to a um, revocation hearing without having a nuisance abatement plan in place, and we're not successful in that revocation hearing, there's no longer anything we can do with the licensee. Everything that he had in place prior to this incident, he can, can continues to get to do, whether it be hours of operation, no security, no lighting, no cameras, whatever, whatever his stance was prior to, he can go right back to that being his stance because we had nothing in place prior to the hearing. So we entered in, we worked out uh, over the months, uh, matter of fact, November to February, uh, we met several times and came up with uh, a plan that we felt was acceptable. Um, and then it was uh, submitted to Corporation Council. They agreed, licensing agreed, and it, he, it was entered into. So um, the, one of the major things with the Renaissance is now they must close every day at 1 a.m. I'm sure everybody's quite aware that they uh, stayed open until 3 or 4 a.m., um, probably Thursday through Sunday quite often. So we, uh, we requested that they close at 1 a.m. every day of the week. Also, their hours of operation will be reviewed in six months. That does give us through the summer. Um, and again, just because it's going to be up for review does not mean it's going to change. Um, I explained to Corporation Council that I needed for the licensee to prove that he can be a good neighbor before I would allow them to ever go past 1 a.m. So this is their opportunity to prove that they can be a good neighbor. Um, they were also uh, required to uh, get additional security, um, one that's armed, uh, female, a female security on scene as well, on site, just because of the fact that you know, it, it does happen. Women do bring weapons in for um, the males that they may be at certain venues with. So, so uh, we in, ensured that that was put in place uh, on the weekends, Friday and Saturday. That's when they're going to have the most security on site. And they have to have a security guard stationed outside of the door um, who can see uh, visibly the sidewalk in, the, in, in front of the establishment at all times. Uh, they also must be recognizable. You must know that they are security. They should have some jacket on, some, some uniform on, stating that they are security. Uh, they also, they're, they have agreed to be uh, responsible for the surroundings of the building because we know that things go off into the, the side parking or the side lot next to the, the establishment. So, that's part of their, their uh, responsibility. The loitering in front of the, the uh, venue, that is their responsibility. Anything going on in back of it. These, and I want everyone to understand, these are all things that they can be cited for because it's all in black and white. It's written, it's something that was signed off on that was agreed upon. So they can be cited for all of these things and be fined for violations. It's just the fact that we have to document it. We have to be made aware of it. So um, they're also using metal detecting wands at the door and they just uh, recently acquired an identification scanner so for those who aren't aware an id scanner scans every attendee's id into a system so you know who's been in your your establishment um so there there's never any um there there will always be an idea whether or not a person was there or not because now they have to scan their id and it goes into a system uh, security cameras, uh, we, we require that they get additional and that they connect them to OMC's private sector camera initiative. Um, they still, they actually have about 15 more days to come in compliance with that. But um, I've been rest, I'm told to uh, not worry that they will meet that deadline. They also have to have the visible signage in front of the establishment regarding minimum age and dress code. Um, 
Uh, one thing uh, that we I felt was really important in talking with the licensee in various meetings is that he attends the CAPS meetings and that he attends the business meetings. Uh, and I stressed to him the CAPS meetings because I wanted him to understand and hear what the residents have been saying about the establishment and what they're up against uh, day in and day out uh, when people attend uh, events at the establishment. So I told him, I said, it's very important that you hear these things you know, from the people that you're affecting so you can make the necessary moves and changes, not just thinking that, oh, the police department's picking on me or no, that didn't happen. If you're hearing it from the citizens, you, there, you, you can't deny it and you have to be responsible and step up. So lastly, the nu nuisance abatement plan applies to anybody who has some kind of involvement with the establishment. So you, it's not, if the police are called and they go to a manager, the manager says, well, I'm not the owner, you're an employee. Um, if there's a, a business partner in there who says, well, I, I'm just a silent partner, you're a partner, you, you have a, a responsibility as well. Um, so it's the licensee's uh, uh, responsibility to ensure that all his employees are aware of this nuisance abatement plan. But however, uh, again, violations ha have to be noted. They have, we have to put them in writing. We have to forward them to uh, licensing and vice control. Uh, but, you know, that's where I really want to ensure that the citizens stay on top of this, you know, call us at least. And here's the thing. If the police don't show up in the, in the, fastest response time that you want, well, you know what we do have? We have your call for service. We have that log that it was, you called up on it, you know? So those are things that we can always present in court that you have continued to call because these issues have been going on. So um, in a nutshell, that's really where we're at with that. Um, again, like I said, we needed that in order to proceed to license revocation. All right, so the bottom line, Commander, and I have several questions in the, in the Q&A here for you. The bottom line is that uh, they will be reopening and that the um, plan of operation or the, the nuisance plan that you put in place is being monitored. And that if there are elements of that plan that are not um, met or followed through on, that that's the step for a nuisance hearing, which could lead to revocation. Is, is that accurate? That is cor correct. So um, any violations, we can cite them, but with those citations, we can move forward to revocation. All right, so um, the first question we have is from Kimberly Butler Brooks. And her question is, the steps you mentioned, Commander, are specific to the facility and the property but how are they going to control what happens outside of the immediate club? Because really it's a dual issue between the club and the police not responding to the issues when they occur. We've literally watched them, meaning the police, pull up and drive away. What specific commitment, if any, do we have from the police department on this matter described here today? Well, it's going to be upon me, and I've, and I've already, because it, it really affects my overnight watch, uh, which is uh, called Midnight's, my Midnight Watch. Um, they've been notified that the nuisance abatement plan is in effect and what it, um, what it entails. And for them to, when they respond to those calls, to take them serious and to document them. As, as, we, as I was informed by Vice Control, having things written on paper is what builds cases. So I've advised my officers, this is what we need to do. And this is how we have to build this case. Regardless if you feel it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a report that you think you can talk yourself out of, it has to get done. Um, one thing I, I really want everyone to understand too, the priority of calls. You know, if you call about loud noise, you call about people drinking on the street, the priority of call is how it's going to get dispatched. And I've always told everybody, OEMC, which is 911, they dictate the priority of the call. The police department doesn't. So when officers are dispatched to call, that's when they show up, but it's the priority. And again, the police department doesn't dictate the priority, the dispatcher does. But uh, again, I, my first watch has been made very clear what needs to happen. And 
I will continue to reinforce that, especially on the weekends, especially as this weather breaks. I, I understand the aggravation that everybody's had, uh, but I felt it was very important that um, I hold the business owner and the licensees to a standard as well, because we can't come there and police your property. It's your responsibility. All right, uh, before we go to the second question, Kimberly also has a, some more. Uh, uh, can the owners be cited for loitering in front of homes? They, they can't be cited for loitering, but uh, um, you know, now again, and I know you all, I know the residents have called the police in the past because I, I know they tend to, they come out the Renaissance and like maybe they've parked on the block and they go to the block and they, they hang out and sit at their cars. That, that's stuff that has to be addressed. And, and I'll take um, ownership for that. Those are things that my officers have to enforce. I don't care if somebody pulls up and says, and tell the officers, we're not doing anything. No, but you don't live on this block and you're causing a disturbance and you, you might be drinking or whatever you might be doing. Leave this block, you know, leave this neighborhood. This is what, you know, this, this, this is just a nuisance in itself. And not even that, you could be preventing something even more from happening, whether it be that person hanging out on your block being robbed or that person on your block being shot at by somebody else riding down the street. So again, I take ownership for that. It's something that I need to ensure that my midnight watch truly enforces um, each and every night. Um, this is from an anonymous person. Uh, when did they start going to CAPS meetings? As neighbors, we have complained repeatedly, they are not a good neighbor. Please don't do this to us. Well, as of February 28th, the nuisance abatement went into effect. Um, I'm not sure when the next CAPS meeting is for that beat offhand. But it starts um, probably at the, I think you've already had the March beat, March beat meeting. So this would probably start in April. Yeah, it, it, it should. It should start in April. I do know that he um, he was on the last business meeting. I do know that, that for sure. But so it was two things he had to uphold to. Um, this anonymous uh, person also has uh, another question. Sunday nights are the worst. Can you at least have them close at 11 on Sunday? Unfortunately, the plan has already been agreed to. Um, and I pushed them, I pulled them back from 2 a.m. to 1 a.m. And, you know, I, I, the thing is, it was going to be a back and forth. And I, that was the easiest way to do it, was just give them one solid time across the board. Again, it's going to come down to holding them responsible for every single thing they're supposed to do. And, and for the police to ensure that we're watching them, ins ensuring that they're enforcing it. Um, you know, this is this is going to be a, a new step forward for everybody involved. But, uh, you know, the thing is, if they're not doing what they're asking, if they're not being good neighbors, then let's go ahead. Let's move forward and get their license re uh, uh, revoked and, you know, shut it down. OK, um, this is from uh, DeAndrea Anderson. She has two questions. What's the plan for the patrons that come further down the block and hang out when they can't get into Bronzeville Renaissance? The neighbors are afraid. Uh, like I, I mentioned before, that you know that onus really falls on the police because they they they're not at the establishment; they are down the block. You know, it falls on the police to be dispatched to that call and come there and inform them that they have to leave the block. I'm I'm a true believer in. If you don't live on the block, you shouldn't be on the block. Um, again, uh, it's teaching these officers, giving, telling these officers you have a voice, you have the law on your side and you need to enforce it. Uh, so uh, I really am going to enforce this or, or you know, really train up my, my midnight watch because I need for this to be successful. Um, because if they're not, that activity is not at the Renaissance, there's nothing we can do about it, but you know, because the activities in the neighborhood. But 
again, I don't want them hanging out on anyone's block, bringing, you know, more trouble or drawing some trouble to the block. The other question is, what is the plan to clean up after those patrons when they drink and eat in their cars outside of our homes and leave trash? Unfortunately, I, I don't have a plan for that. I, you know, that comes with us being able to get individuals off the block, um, you know, but I, and I hate to say it, it's the priority of call. Um, but you know, I, there there are a couple of things that I could definitely put in place. Um, I, I don't want to say them be, and not be able to do it, but there are some things I'm thinking about putting in place that may uh, assist us in that effort. Um, so if if I get it put in place in a timely fashion, I'll definitely make sure that the Ottoman lets everyone know. Uh, again, it, it, it's going to come down to my police being available and getting on that block, you know, in a timely manner to get people off the block. I will say to uh, DeAndrea that the business owner himself is responsible for cleaning up uh, directly in front and directly behind his business. I do know that they were cleaning up to the corner of 46 um, Place uh, and to 47th Street. Um, so we can also double check with the uh, business owners on that as well. Um, another question came up, who are the business owners and who holds the license? The um, owners of the business are two men by the name of Shun Dice and John McClendon. They own the license. Um, a question from Anthony Rogers. Commander, will the security cameras connected to OEMC be able to pick up the nuisance activity as well? We, we're going to have to see. Um, they, they have to have a foot, 15 foot radius um, outside of the premise. So uh, with the additional cameras they installed, we, uh, we're going to have to see if they meet the requirements when we log into OEMC and see it uh, live. But that was one of our concerns, especially in the front, on the side and in the rear, that you have cameras that allow for any activity to be recorded or any activity to be viewed in, in, on a live feed. Um, I am going to, Brian, is it possible to, I don't know who this anonymous caller, this anonymous attendee is, but DeAndrea Anderson, is it possible to free up her so she can speak? Because this question that she has, I don't really understand it. Of course, hold on a moment. Uh, Ms. Anderson, the question had to do with legal options. Could you explain what you mean by that? And while Hello, can you? Can okay, you hear me? Yes. So we um, obviously are having a lot of challenges while I respect and want to support every black business. This one is really a problem for us. Um, I don't know what options we have as residents to ensure that we aren't up till one o'clock in the morning every time the Renaissance is open, which tends to be the case because as people are coming and going, they park further down the block. So I don't know what options we have. This is this is a real problem. Is the lot next to the Renaissance available for use? I'm not even sure why people have to park that far down in front of the residential units. Should we get permit parking? What options do we have as residents to protect our homes so that we aren't picking up the trash and so that we can actually sleep at night? Well, the lot that is next to the Renaissance is a private lot. I don't know who owns it. Um, uh, in terms of residential permit parking, that really is not an option um, for a venue like this because they're not always open during the day. I mean, they're, they don't have events during the day. Um, and it does not seem to be a, a place where uh, parking is you know, very difficult for the residents. Um, this is really an issue where we have to have um, good policing. 
Um, and that means that the residents have to call and the police have to do their job. Plain and simple. Um, and on that matter, um, Commander, um, what are the benchmarks for the night watch? I want, um, I want no calls whatsoever at the Renaissance. I don't want residents calling. Um, so, it, I mean, obviously one call is one, one call too many, but I, I want us, we need to get ahead of this before anything even starts, before the weather breaks, where it's just great to stand out all night. Um, so that's why I, I'm, I really want to come up with a solid op plan of operation addressing this on a daily basis, on a nightly basis. Um, but the benchmark is no calls whatsoever or uh, no calls whatsoever and being sure that we can document any violations of this nuisance plan. Because I, I'm not, I, I just, it's not fair. It's not fair that you've been given this opportunity um, and, and then you skate under it. I'm going to hold him to this uh, tooth and nail. Okay, um, is this uh, going to be a uh, agenda item at the CAPS meeting so people can follow the data? I can ensure that it is. I can uh, talk with our CAPS sergeant and ensure that he includes this. Uh, to the anonymous attendee that says, why didn't you come to us, the taxpayer, the neighbor with the plan so that we could have input? Um, I think that's an excellent question. The law department and this, the police department basically uh, came up with the plan of operations. This is how they operate. Um, as you all know, there is uh, a new day in uh, the administration regarding uh, the way that the administration deals with aldermen. And we have to, you know, I've had to fight just to even see the uh, plans before they were signed or signed. Uh, when I saw this one, it had been signed. So this is an ongoing issue that um, I have with the law department, um, not so much with the second district, but more so with the law department. And that's some, a battle that many aldermen are working on. From from the police standpoint, uh, you know, I agree. Like, you know, why isn't there some sort of town hall or, or something along that nature? You know, and I, I really think so the law department can hear firsthand what the concerns and issues are. Um, because honestly, it's the law department who in the end drafts everything. I can object to a lot of things, but they're, you know, they tend to side on giving you know business owners chances and you know that's how I felt in a, a lot of circumstances when I have to do these nuisance abatement plans but I completely agree I, I really think this is something that you know citizens should all have a say in. Um, and I guess that you all have heard about uh, the attack on all the manic prerogative this is an example for me all the manic prerogative really means community input and uh, in this case, uh, that did not happen. Um, it should have happened. And hopefully in the future, you all will fight with me so that we can make sure that this gets done. Um, a few more questions for you, Commander. What is the number of complaints that uh, Renaissance Bronzeville has received in the last year? I currently don't, don't have those numbers with me. I can get them to you though. Okay. Why is this club being allowed to reopen when bars, clubs, and other districts have been permanently closed for much less than a murder on the property? Um, I don't know that that's actually true. Um, to the anon That's an anonymous attendee again. I don't know that that's actually true. In fact, um, the ones that have been closed have usually been closed on the fact that they don't have a license at all, or um, after some prolonged fight at a, you know, at, in, a, in a court. Um, I can think of, for example, Bottle Blonde that was closed after a prolonged fight, 
or um, there was one in the South Loop that was closed basically because they did not have a, a business license at all and were operating. Uh, another one that was closed because they had a, uh, a murder outside of their property, um, but that was also a prolonged struggle. Um, so I don't agree that uh, places have been permanently closed for much less. Brian, did you want to add to that? I saw your hand go up. Oh, thank you, Alderman. Uh, misclicked. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, uh, Vincent Brown has a question. In regard to the Renaissance, should the owner be asked to remind their patrons to not water and leave the area when they leave the venue? That is, that is part of the plan. That's part of what security is uh, supposed to be doing. And it, again, that's one of those things. If it's not being done, I want to ensure that my officers are seeing it or made aware of it. Um, my business officer, I have a business liaison officer. Um, he's going to stay on top of this as well. Uh, again, it just, you know, this nuisance abatement plan is, um, you know, it, it's basically when I was thin, you're on thin ice. And so if you screw up on this ice, you, you're going to drown. So I, again, I, I would need to hold him to this, and that is part of what they're supposed to do in the nuisance abatement plan. Um, Kimberly Butler Brooks wants to know who does she speak to about having the cleanup radius extended? Again, all of this is for the immediate club, not the community. Um, the by by ordinance, Ms. Brooks, the 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 business is only required to clean. Um, their establishment in front of them and the establishment behind them. They're not required by ordinance to do anything else. Um, they have agreed to uh, go from 46th place to 47th street. Um, I plan to speak to them about the possibility of extending their, uh, you know, extending the area that they clean, um, but they are not required by law to do so. Okay, the other question has to do with something that is for another meeting. Okay, anonymous attendee wants to know how can we support this business and keep a safe and clean neighborhood? I don't think it's helpful to run a black business out of our neighborhoods and then complain about not having options for entertainment, dining and merchandising. Um, absolutely agree. I mean, I think that it would be worthwhile for some of the neighbors to get together and uh, sit down with Sean and John and, and have a conversation about the impact that their business has on uh, the adjacent neighborhood. You know, sometimes looking somebody in the eye, um, getting to know someone, and actually um, perhaps Yvette Warren, I see you on the call here, Maybe this is something that you could help facilitate as uh, DC is responsible for 47th Street and actually that corner around the corner there. Um, I would ask you if perhaps maybe you could facilitate a meeting between some of the neighbors and uh, the owners of Bronzeville Renaissance. I'm sorry, absolutely, Alderman Dow. And I would just need to have a contact for coordinating the residents. Okay, and if you're interested in that, just um, say so in the um, Q&A and someone from my staff will pick up your email and we'll forward it to Yvette. Um, I see four more questions here, and then they're going to, then I think we're gonna close this subject. One is from Kim Sanders. Uh, Commander, she wants to know what is the hierarchy for calls made to 311, I mean 911. Just wanted to know how we can get a better response when we call for loitering, loud disturbances, drug activity, et cetera. Unfortunately, um, the priority is 1234. Um, you know, those calls or those instances that you mentioned fall in between uh, three and four. So, um, you know, 
unless the call, if there is a number of uh, priority one and two calls that are ongoing, those are gonna be the calls that get answered first. And until those priority one and two calls are answered, um, then they'll start going down the, the ladder to threes and fours. Uh, again, you know, that's just how the system was, was made. So, you know, we can respond to domestic disturbances, men with a gun, shootings, homicides. So those all take priority over, you know, loud disturbances, drinking on the public way, parking violations. Uh, again, you know, uh, is it the best system? Probably not. But, you know, I didn't create the system and we don't we don't dispatch our own calls. The official reopen date. You said, "What's the official reopen date?" Mm -hmm. I haven't been told yet. I thought I thought they would have opened up as soon as the uh, it was signed off on, but apparently they haven't. Okay, we can check with the um, owners on the official reopen date. Anthony, got that? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, anonymous attendee wants to know, you mentioned six months. When does the six, month, six months begin and end? The six months uh, is going to end right at the end of August, but um, I'm going to be unavailable to discuss that till after the holiday in September. So, so we'll say after the holiday in September. All right, Kimberly Butler Brooks says, for the record, neighbors on the 4,500 to 4,600 block had that meeting last year. I'm not sure if that was, was that a meeting, Kimberly? Uh, and I'll ask Brian if you could unmute her with the owners. Hi, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so the owners and residents on um, the 4,500 to 4,600 block, we sat and met with the owners. We met with them in person to your point about meeting people face to face. We explained to them, we wanted to be supportive. We shared a lot of what's being shared by residents tonight and nothing changed. So we personally implored them and we went up there and patronized their business, sat on their patio, bought drinks. We did what we thought good neighbors were supposed to do. So it's just a little frustrating when we've done what we thought we could do um, and still be in this position. Well, I think uh, to, uh, just to respond to that, Kimberly, thank you for your comments. Um, I think that the difference between last year and this year is that they didn't have the threat of a uh, um, plan of operation with a six month time period over their head. Um, and they had not had a very serious uh, incident like a uh, shooting. Um, was that a homicide, Commander? No, it wasn't. It was not, okay, a shooting. So um, they're probably, uh, what's the word, motivated to uh, have a better relationship with the community because the next step is actually revocation, which is something I'm sure they don't want. Um, and the last question, Commander, is, uh, and then we need to go on. Have there been any problems more severe than nuisance items at this particular business? The, the only one was the, the shooting that took place. That was the most serious uh, incident that took place. One last question and then, uh, Amanda, I'm gonna answer your question, but one last question from someone else, Commander. Can the six months start when they open? It definitely can. I can have that conversation uh, with the owner, uh, with Corporation Council, it, it definitely can. You know, I'm, I'm just glad that, you know, I really want them, the, the hours to maintain, especially through the summer, because I know that's when things really heat up over there. So. But I, yeah, I have no, no problem with that. And again, the hours can't change unless I agree to it. So if I'm not available to talk about it, they'll never change. 
Um, Commander, I want to support that uh, suggestion because, you know, sometimes when people have less of a uh, runway, they, they do better than if the runway was a little longer and they had to really perform up to a certain level consistently over time. So I would be in support of starting that six months at the point in which they open as well. And we'll Absolutely. Um, Amanda, to your question about the possibility of getting parking only for the, for the residents, um, I'm not opposed to that, um, which would be residential permit parking. I definitely need to see how the um, parking looks when they open. Um, it's not a, a decision that I make on my own. It's also based on uh, a study that the Department of Revenue does. Uh, to see if the block warrants um, permit parking. So, Commander, thank you for your time on this. You're welcome, thank you. Um, I will have you back uh, somewhere in the middle of that six month period so you can just give us an update on how they're doing. All right. Thank you. All right. The second item on our agenda tonight is, um, I know everybody knows this guy, High Cliff, Chef Cliff Rome. Uh, he has a, a number of businesses in our community. Um, he has recently approached me about some changes in his business operations that he wants to uh, um, pursue. And I've asked him to just come and give a presentation tonight along with his attorney, um, Amy Degnan. Hello, Amy. Good to see you too. Um, and uh, without further ado, I turn it over to Chef Cliff Rome. Hi. Um, good evening, Alderman Dowell. And, and oh, thank I'm you. turning it over to the attorney first. Hi, Amy. Sorry. Hi, Alderman. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who's participating tonight. Um, my name is uh, Amy Degnan. I'm with the law firm Georges and Sinawiki, and I'm here tonight um, on behalf of Cliff Rome and joined by Cliff Rome. As the alderman gave a great introduction, I know probably many of you are very familiar with uh, Cliff's work in Rome's Joy Companies, and we're thrilled to be here tonight to talk about um, seeking approval for a public place of amusement license for 4445 and 4455 South King Drive. Um, as you may know, uh, Rome's Joy is operating out of the Parkway Ballroom and um, the Blanc Gallery and seeking to just apply for a PPA license that would allow for them to collect revenues for events that they're already having. Um, again, we wanna be clear tonight, we, we are not asking to have more events, not asking to have bigger events. Um, these are all events that are currently happening at the facility that uh, we're just looking to license appropriately. Um, if I could just show you, this is an aerial of the site, just to orient you slightly with Martin Luther King Drive and 45th Street. Um, you can see 4445 and 4455, uh, along with the parking in the back. Um, <clears throat> as part of our licensing applications, we've been working with the alderman and with the zoning department. There's a split zoning lot. Um, so behind the parking that's behind the Parkway Social is actually zoned RM5 when the remainder of the site is zoned B33. And that's something that the zoning department along with the aldermen as part of this application process would like for us to fix. It's common to fix it. Um, it's not something that uh, the city really likes to see split zoning lots. So uh, we, as part of this application for the PPA for the two venues, have agreed that we would rezone um, this back parking lot to a B33. And with that, I'm going to um, introduce Cliff Rome, but it sounds like most of you probably already know him, and he can talk you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. And Alderman, thank you so much for allowing us to 
have a presence on the platform. So to, to all of you that I don't know, um, welcome to Bronzeville. My name is Cliff Rome. I'm the proprietor of a company called Rome's Dre Companies. Our brand is, is, consists actually of a couple brands. Parkway Ballroom, which is the brick and mortar. It is the swing and sway of Bronzeville. It, at least it was in the 40s. It opened in the late 40s. It closed down. We reopened in 2002. The idea was to be able to continue on an era of elegance, um, events, from proms, graduations, to uh, fundraisers, et cetera. That is exactly what we have been doing for the last 20 years. 20 years goes by fast. And so what we realized is that because we were so steeped in history and culture, what we wanted to do is continue to build not just our brands, but build our brands specifically on the south side of Chicago. Outside of the Parkway Ballroom, we have Rome's Dre Catering. Rome's Dre Catering is actually the license holder. It is how we make our money. It is what we have been doing. It's how we employ people. It's a full service catering company um, that provides food and beverage uh, options to the actual facility. Uh, we actually have um, an on-site license uh, for catering for liquor. We have an off-premise catering license. We have a food and retail license. All of those things help comprise exactly what it is that we've been providing for the last 20 years. Under, under that portfolio and part of that brand on that campus, we have Blunt Gallery. Blunt Gallery is located 4445. It's just uh, north of the actual parkway. A lot of you guys have come out. If you haven't, please come. We need that support. We want that support. It is a facility that is steeped in art. It is a platform for uh, emerging artists as well as established artists, be it local, national, or international. Uh, for the last 12 years, we've been able to become a, a part of what we call a, a culture of conversation. It became a space where artists truly can become that artist. A lot of names that you know, a lot of names that will be coming. So part of the goal for the gallery was to be able to actually talk about artistic, our artistic art and help grow part of the things that we want to be able to do in, in, in the, not just in the facility, but kind of what used to go on. In the 1940s, you had the likes of Duke Ellington, Nat King Cole, Cap Calloway. All those folks not only lived in Brownsville, but they performed at the Parkway Ball. So for us, it's not reinventing the wheel. It's really about standing on the shoulders of the folks that created these opportunities for us. Along that corridor, just going a little further south, we have Peaches Restaurant. Peaches is one of the culinary cornerstones in Bronzeville. So we've been there on March 1st, we turned seven years old. Part of the goal was to be able to continue not only to create our jobs in the community, but create a platform for folks who actually wanted to be better contributors within the community in which they serve. Example, a person who lives in the community, works at Peaches, goes down to two fish for dinner, cashes their check over it, um, Illinois Service Bank, GM Bank, goes and picks up their cleaners from 47th Street Cleaners, and then lives down the street. The idea and the goal was to be able to help continue to push that economic engine by opening these businesses and creating viable resources for folks who live actually in the community. And so between the parkway, between bronze, um, the gallery, peaches, we have another program which we, we, we like to brag about, it's a training program, which we partner with the Illinois Restaurant Association and the National Restaurant Association. At the end of the day, it's about creating jobs. That's what we've done for 20 years. That's what we continue to do, and that's what we want to do. We understand the power of partnership. So instead of doing it by ourselves, what we latched on to is relationships with existing businesses, be it in Bronzeville or outside. So from soups and salads to two fish to actually going to Brown Sugar Bakery, we work with virtual restaurants. So these are the opportunities that we're trying to create is, is nothing that hasn't already been here. So for us, it gives us great pride in saying, we wanna be able to not only do that, we wanna to add to that platform by being able to have the, the types of events that we're already having, but we wanna make sure that we can accentuate those things by making sure that we have these services. So for us, the goal is to be able to do these things in our community and not have to always leave outside of the community. When we speak about parking, we have a huge parking lot. We can park, generally when we have events, we have valet service. So we have the cap uh, capacity to park up to 300 cars. We have security on staff, and then we have external companies that we work with for that. I heard um, earlier we were talking about cleaning the facility or outside the property. 
we have a janitorial team that we've added to our um, list of jobs and, and things that we've created uh, under our brand where we go out and naturally do that. So we allow our neighbors who are currently across the street and down the street to be able to park in the parking lot. We make sure that our guys get up in the morning, they're out as part of the team to make sure that they clean up the block. Not just starting in front of the parkway, but at Vincennes all the way back around to Mollison School. So we have viable part of what we're doing. So for us, the proof of concept is that not only have we been doing it, but then we have a, a legacy that we want to leave behind in terms of creating more and more opportunities for folks. With this license, it, it gives us the opportunity to continue to do and build what we start out to do. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Um, as we mentioned, we just wanted to thank uh, the aldermen uh, for allowing us to present today. We'd also like to thank the neighbors and businesses that provided 17 letters of support for this license change for Rome's Joy Companies. Um, and with that, we'd like to answer any questions. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I, I just want to say I think uh, Cliff you have been a terrific um, business in the community. You've uplifted Bronzeville in many ways. And I'm glad that you have an opportunity today to let people know about your uh, business plans. Um, there aren't very many questions in the chat. I'm gonna tell you the good things and then we're gonna go to the question. Um, you have uh, from DeAndrea Anderson, I fully support the Parkway Ballroom Entertainment License. They are good neighbors and hire locally. We've never had any issues with the patrons they attract to the venue. From Kimberly Butler Brooks, RJC is a classy example of a great community partner. From Leslie Anderson Rutland, I fully support this request. Chef Rome has been a staunch supporter of our community for years. And this allows us to expand a great business in our community, revenue, jobs, community, exclamation point. Um, so now here comes the questions. Will the parking accommodations that you currently have accommodate the crowds? I think Peaches is a wonderful addition to, the, to Bronzeville. That's great. Um, I can answer and then Cliff, certainly if you have more to add, please feel free. But as Cliff said, uh, the parking layout, um, once we rezone that section from RM5 to the B33, accommodates about laid out 200 cars. But as Cliff said, with valet service, they can get up to 300 cars. So we believe there's not been a parking issue that's been um, for any of the past events. I don't know, Cliff, if you can add some more information. Absolutely. I, I think that the premise is for most of the events, people generally ride together. So that would give us a total capacity of about 600 people. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I think that when we have events, there's besides um, Parkway and the gallery, Bonneson School is the only uh, other business on that block. And generally during the hours that we have events, which are typically on the weekend, there's no parking. So that gives an additional maybe 100 cars to street parking. So there's a total, we, we have plenty of, there's plenty of parking. Mm -hmm. I'd also, if I can, I'd like to add, we have a letter of support from Mollison School. Okay, um, I do have a question from Vincent Brown. It's the same question and I think this is for me. Will there be residential permanent parking for residents in regards to the Parkway Ballroom project? I'm concerned about parking spaces being taken up by those attending events at the venue. Um, I, I would, I'm not going to say no, but um, I've never had any complaints from residents now about the events that uh, um, Chef Rome has at uh, Blanc or at Parkway Ballroom or when there's events going on in both places at the same time. So it does not seem to be a problem that requires a residential parking permit program. As uh, Amy said, uh, it looks like the parking lot can accommodate um, about 200 to 300 cars. So um, I would say, let's wait and see. Uh, it turns out to be an issue. Parking turns out to be an issue and I'm getting complaints and we can prove up that it's coming from the Parkway Ballroom, then a residential PPP program might be uh, in order. 
Um, now let me go back down here. Let's see what else we have. Um, uh, Kimberly Butler Brooks, can Chef Rome share what upcoming events are happening that uh, we, the community, can support? Well, thank you, Kimberly. Um, right now, we don't have anything on the back end. As, as we all remember, um, two years of COVID um, in our particular industry and hospitality and food service totally decimated the, the industry. And so what we're doing is we, we're, we're picking up on the vibrancy of, of events and, and the pulse of folks just wanting to get out. And so I think we're, we'll, we're leaning into uh, creating a calendar for events um, that we plan to have over the summer and then leading into the fall. So then that way we have a, 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 a true calendar of things to, to come. We're partnered, the partnerships that we're excited about um, are really cool because it, it gives us the opportunity to do things in the space that we typically go other places for. And because of the campus, you know, the, the, the whole goal too really is to make it more walkable. We see this in other neighborhoods and other communities. And so we want folks to feel safe. We want them to know that there's amenities that that's right here. You can ride your bike or walk down the street. So as we start to fill the calendar, we would absolutely unequivocally make sure that everyone knows exactly what's going on. All right. Uh, thanks, Cliff. Um, it's great to see a community invested business has proven to be a great neighbor. Sandra Bivens, I totally support Cliff. Teaches as a business that is positive for the growth of Bronzeville and Cliff participates in many community activities. Sherry Williams, I absolutely am support of the Parkway Ballroom. Brandon Hendricks, I just wanna say thanks to Cliff for respecting all of us on 45th Street. Carla Morgan, no questions, but beautiful space chef. I've enjoyed the few events I've attended there over the years. Chef Rome, I think you can put everybody in this room. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Full support, salute, Gian Foreman, uh, Ty, Troy P Pryor. This is an amazing opportunity for our community and culture. Um, here's one for you, uh, Chef Roman, uh, uh, Amy Degnan. How will the license change the venue or the events that they bring? It, you wanna, it doesn't, uh, in, in terms of, uh, it just adds additional uh, revenue to our bottom line. I've been, let's not have two boys that, that, that want to go to college. So I need to be able to pay for it. And so the idea is that we've been funding this. Um, all the types of activations that we typically couldn't charge for um, now gives us an opportunity to, to make it a, a fair kind of uh, amenity for the public. Thank you, Chef Rome. Uh, Lakia Ellis, I live directly across the street and not had an issue with parking during Cliff's event. I agree with that. I live across the street too. I totally support this project. It is positive and Bronzeville oriented. He supports our community and its history. Um, question for you, when you say valet service, where will those valets be parking those cars? So generally what happens is uh, most cars uh, turn into the 45th street and they pull right in front of the parkway. So we'll comb the first, generally like when we have uh, weddings, for example. So we'll comb the first four parking spaces, guests then get out and then they take the car around via the ramp and then park in the rear and then bring it back um, as a return service uh, facing west on 45th street. Okay. Um... No questions, Amanda Williams, no questions, but want to resoundingly support Chef Rome. He has helped our family personally. Our daughters love Peach's pancakes. Uh, <laughs> you've been impressed with uh, your large events are happening. Uh, they've never seen a parking issue. Um, Troy Pryor, I recently met Cliff as a neighbor on the same block of Blanc and Parkway. And as an arts organizer in the community, I'm excited about all that's to come. Can you talk a bit, please, about the types of events you're thinking of adding with the PPA? I'm a foodie, so definitely need to start with food. Um, I think that what we recognize is that in our community, specifically on the south side of Chicago, um, we're institution deficient. 
And so we don't have enough spaces to be able to um, get out our talent. And so one of the things that we want to do um, is make sure that we can highlight the culinary arts part of the hospitality part. The, the, the second part of that is that I am at heart truly a, a film person. So um, one of the things that we are definitely going to do is a Parkway Picture Show. That is a salute to um, some of the great artists of the day that used to have movie screens. Uh, actually, one that comes to mind was uh, Melvin Van Peebles. I met him in Europe and he came to Chicago. He, filmed, he screened one of his films here. So we're working with the Chicago International Film Festival. We're working um, with a couple of different organizations that really are gonna highlight that type of creative um, activation. We're, we're adding a podcast room so we're able to um, do live podcasts from a space and then have it open for folks who actually want to come and rent the space. So those are just a couple of things that, that we have in mind. But believe me, it'll be things where we don't necessarily have to leave out of the community. And that, that is kind of the, the, the goal for us is to be able to cre create these um, opportunities within our own community. All right. Um, another one, no parking issues. Um, you've been thoughtful of this fact. Um, uh, Deneen Sanders, have you considered using the Harold Washington Cultural Center? I'm not sure what that question means, perhaps for parking. Um, Courtney McEwen, where can they receive the calendar of events once it's up? Do you have a website, Cliff? Um, our current website is, is going to be revised, so it is romesjoy.com. Um, but there isn't any current information uh, on there. So um, we're, we're planning to make sure that we could have that updated by the top of the second quarter. Okay, um, we're coming to the end of your questions. Um, Phaedra Leslie, she supports your entertainment license, you're a great community partner, jobs great, growth great. Is there any community focused programming plan? Um, through our not for profit which is Mies and Plus, it's our culinary and hospitality um, aspect of what we do. The goal is to be able to not um, just grow that in a very aggressive way. Part of creating jobs in the community is making sure that we have um, landing spots for folks. We've cultivated partnerships with Chicago Cook Workforce and University of Chicago IIT. These are larger spaces where we're able to not only train, uh, we keep some of those folks and they work uh, under our brands, but the, the goal is to be able to continue to, to, to reach out to those other spaces where we're able to have great jobs for those folks who still live in the community. Do we have discounts for the community on renting out the venue? Yes, we, we actually will be and have been offering not for profit um, discounts for institutions um, and then historical institutions that are in the community and not limited to the South Side, obviously. Um, there's uh, fraternity and sorority uh, discounts that we offer. So yes, there's a, there's a host of discounts that we, we've offered and we'll continue to offer. Uh, Yasmin Curtis, uh, as a business owner in the community, I fully support Chef Ron. <laughs> Dorothy Capers, amazing opportunity. Chef Ron is top notch. Paula Robinson, Hope you do more unique outdoor events on the real lots. You want to respond to that, Cliff, or no? Yeah, no. So um, one of the things that we, we had thought about doing um, outside of our, our food thing is a drive-in. I mean, I grew up in an era where you would go to the drive-in, you catch a movie, and when I saw what was happening at Soldier Field, it, it, it kind of sparked some ideas of creativeness. One of the things that I think that we have to um, utilize to combat some of the issues that we have in, in the community is, is having things that folks don't necessarily see. And so um, outdoor, we're, think, we're, we're heavily thinking about um, events that we've hosted before, but being able to uh, highlight those in a different way and, and, and creating a more visceral kind of um, community uh, impact. All right. Um... Then the last comment is, uh, when you speak of Bronzeville and its elegance of the past, this is from Erica Robinson, we really wanna speak of it in the present. Chef Rome has pushed the envelope to bring the essence of 
elegance back to Bronzeville. I'm in full support of Chef Rome and RJC obtaining the PPA license. So it looks like you had a good, uh, good response there, Cliff. So uh, I will be talking to you soon. Uh, anything you want to uh, end up saying, Amy or Cliff, in closing? Um, I just wanted to thank you, Alderman, and thank everyone who attended the meeting this evening. Thank you for taking time out of your busy evenings, and we so appreciate um, all of the comments we received. And I know Cliff uh, does great work and obviously speaks for itself, so we're excited to bring this um, continued uh, great service to Bronzeville. Um, I just want to echo what Amy said. Alderman, thank you so much for the platform. Um, to everyone who said all those kind words. Um, not only do we appreciate it, but we, we it is it has definitely been an uphill battle in a mudslide. Um, but the idea is to make sure that we can continue to grow. Um, we'll make sure that we continue to listen. Um, we want to add not just jobs, but we want to add um, value to what it is that we're doing and what we plan on continuing to do for the next 20 years plus. So thank you so, so very much. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, we have with us tonight Tyrone Muhammad from uh, Tyrone. You're going to have to. I know. I know some of what ex-cons. I don't know for what you, for community and social change. That's ECCSC. Right. Okay. Yes, so I know that. Ty, uh, who is the executive director? And he's also been joined by Charles Wu, his business partner. And they had, they came to me maybe about three weeks ago, um, wanting to open up a uh, cannabis related uh, business on 51st Street. Um, so take it away, Mr. Muhammad and Mr. Wu. Okay, um, let me get started. Um, we are looking to uh, open a location near the corner of uh, 50. Before you get started like that, Mr. Wu, I want you to tell people who you are. Describe who you are. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So uh, thank you again, uh, Alderman Dahl, uh, for uh, giving us, letting us use your platform. Uh, my name is Charles and uh, I am uh, the minority investor uh, that will be supporting Tyrone. Um, in this endeavor. Um, I am a, uh, I went to school uh, in Hyde Park about 20 years ago. And uh, I'll tell a little bit more, more about my story um, in a second. But first, uh, what, how this kind of came to being is uh, I met Tyrone um, some time ago, and I was um, very impressed with uh, the work that he was doing and specifically around what he did uh, related to violence prevention and uh, community engagement. And uh, I don't think it's good for me to talk about what Tyrone does. Uh, so maybe Tyrone, uh, I'll let you kind of maybe take the floor in terms of his ideas. And really what we're looking to do is to create an entity to solve some of the problems that have been occurring at that Sitco station um, near 51st and Indiana. So Tyrone, why don't you uh, take the floor, you know, talk about violence prevention and much of the work that you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I can't wait to talk about that because that's the issue that's near and dear to me. My name is Tyrone Muhammad. As the alderman has said, I'm the executive director for Ex-Cons for Community and Social Change. That's ECCSC, a violence prevention, conflict resolution, behavior modification, mentor organization. Our headquarters is located at 610 West Root Street. For those who don't know that, that's like 41st between Wallace and Halstead. And um, I served 21 years in prison. And my story is, is, is like a lot of the guys that that's uh, coming in and out of prison. But in this case, I saw uh, my release or my time as an opportunity to be the change we want to see. So our motto at ECCSC is, it's going to take us to save us. 
I've been out for four years. And I can say that a little over four years. And I can say since I've been out, we've been very intricate um, and a, a staple in the communities throughout Chicago in reducing violence as well as recidivism. Since the beginning of uh, ECCSC, I can once again personally say ECCSC has put over 250 or more ex-cons to work. We're not asking for handouts. We never have. We, we, I came right out of prison and I can, I can actually say that with the touches of ECCSC and the work that we do in the neighborhoods, we have probably intervened in over 300 shootings potentially and, and, and mediated at least 300 or more conflicts that could have potentially um, resulted into uh, violence. So I'm, I'm happy that also Commander Wallace is online because I've been intending, and that's, 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 that's probably my fault because I, sh I should have got with the Alderman Dow on this, on this front to get with Commander Wallace because I've heard a lot about you. That particular corner on 51st Street, I've responded on several uh, uh, incidents with, along with Glenn Brooks uh, and, and a number of other um, lieutenant and sergeant, whether, it was, whether it's shootings or potential incidents on that corner. And I saw that corner as an opportunity to um, get at some of the violence and the blight by creating um, jobs and, 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 and being in public safety on that whole, in that whole script, that script that is uh, 51st in Indiana, that whole building um, that we will have an imprint on. And with that being said, I would most definitely like to answer uh, as many questions that can be posed to me uh, in this line. And I'll let Charles finish the presentation and I would really like to um, entertain as many questions as possible, um, as specifically around public safety, re-entry, and job creation of these returning citizens. Great, thank you, Tyrone, uh, for your introduction. And now I'll tell you guys a little bit more about uh, myself. Um, my name is Charles, and uh, I am a, a product, I guess, of privilege. I was uh, born of immigrant parents that were well-educated and grew up in the suburbs. Um, one of the things uh, that occurred to me, though, is I attended school um, in Hyde Park at the university. And at the time, it was a uh, way to build my resume, but I needed to add community service um, to my resume. So what I did was uh, I started a tutoring service where uh, about 20, 24, 23 years ago, um, I started by going to Randolph Towers, which was a uh, former housing project um, and found unattended children who had parents that were happy to have someone take them and read to them uh, on a Sunday afternoon. And then I synced up with uh, the local church. It was called St. Anselm Church, and it actually is still there. And we used that as a forum um, for uh, tutoring and mentoring these young children. Now, uh, what started as just a resume builder uh, over a span of three years, um, I built up relationships um, with these children that I tutored. And I went from being a person that said, hey, McDonald's can hire anybody, so why worry about that, to really understanding um, the realities of uh, the situation at hand. And it was very uh, eye-opening, I guess might be the best way of saying it, because effectively the uh, deck is stacked against um, people in this community and it, it's unfortunate. So uh, at the time being 2021, uh, there was little I could do. Uh, so I went on uh, my way. But what's actually interesting is there are some fascinating parallels um, between my story and uh, Tyrone's, which really highlights some of the uh, injustice that we see in society. So out of uh, my University of Chicago frat house, I started a business uh, that at the time was considered unlicensed. We used uh, wireless frequencies 
used by microwave ovens and perhaps somewhat illegally or through gray market areas, uh, use that to transmit critical communications. Um, today, that technology now is known as Wi-Fi and it's very widely spread. But back when I started, it was not around and it was not very, uh, it, it was not a recommended, it wasn't blatantly illegal, but it wasn't a pathway for, uh, you know, data communications uh, at the time. Um, in my case, that turned into uh, me becoming a relatively successful entrepreneur that was, um, you know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was lucky and successful. Now, what's interesting is um, probably around that time, uh, Tyrone also was involved in a business uh, that at the time was considered, um, you know, un illegal. And uh, I guess just like me, he was actually fairly resourceful and successful. And, um, you know, he owns it, but he rose up the ranks of a fairly well-known organization um, on the South side uh, and was very successful in those veins. And I guess what's unfortunate is uh, in the case of that unlicensed business, um, Tyrone got put in detention um, for quite some time, uh, Tyrone, I, I won't even try to speak about your experience, but it just was what it just is what it is, and it's uh, really unfortunate. So, uh, what happened with me was uh, I'm a technology person, and uh, I had evolved into uh, doing technology for the cannabis industry. So we were basically building greenhouses and grow houses. And if you look back in time, uh, I had gotten involved uh, with a project about six years ago where we were helping uh, Missouri put together one of the first uh, CBD, which is another form of, you know, a lighter form of cannabis uh, greenhouses. And the problem uh, that was there was that nobody wants a cannabis greenhouse in their backyard because there's a pretty distinctive odor. So uh, the owners of the company were having problems finding a location. And they looked and looked and looked, and they finally found a location um, in a fairly rural and remote area on top of a hill across the street overlooking the penitentiary. Now, um, people on this call or people who understand uh, stuff probably realize how, uh, I think the right term is the hypocrisy of the situation, right? Where literally you have people who are uh, in detention who might get a few hours a day of sunlight walking out, and then they can smell the odors of uh, people outside who are generally lighter skinned, who are making money off the same thing that they're spending years and years, if not life, uh, in prison for. Um, seeing that really made me uh, start looking at myself. And I guess I was in a situation where uh, I had some financial flexibility. So I left that organization, which uh, you know eventually went public, but that's no big deal, and decided that I wanted to get involved uh, with the plant touching side uh, in Illinois and specifically focus on social equity because that was uh, the policy of what Illinois was doing. Um, fast forward a little bit, uh, we obviously, everyone who's in the industry might realize that these cannabis licenses are a bit of, uh, you know, there are some issues, but I met uh, you know, Mr. Mohammed and our relationship has developed. And he's someone who uh, has impressed me greatly. Um, I believe a lot in, and I'm gonna support to uh, build a cannabis related business uh, as part of his vision of bringing economic development and jobs and community um, into the Bronzeville area. So I'm gonna switch over to Tyrone because what's happened is uh, we're collaborating uh, for a brand uh, that he's put together. Uh, it's called Support Your Local Weed Man. And Tyrone, do you want to maybe talk more about uh, what Support Your Local Weed Man is all about? I think you could speak to the business uh, idea that you want to bring to 51st Street in terms of what it is, its hours of operations, you know, your business operations. Thanks, Tyrone. Yeah. So, in that case, then I would defer back to Charles and as it relates to our hours, the whole model and, and the whole block that we intend to use eventually. But for now, we're talking about the photos that he have um, on the screen, sharing on the screen. Oh, should, I go, 
you want yes. to? Yes, yes, do the business model and we could talk about, I'll go in the photo and support your local weed man, Alderman, you can see these are men who formed incarcerated who we're teaching uh, growth to. We're teaching them um, uh, what that propagation looked like, what processing looked like, and getting them acclimated into the, um, the infusion and the different aspects of the business. And now even in front, you see us demonstrating and uh, protesting as a sort in front of a cannabis dispensary in front of that where they are legal dope dealers. They have been made legal um, dispensaries while everybody out there in front of this picture have been incarcerated for cannabis, yet they are not afforded the opportunity to even work in a dispensary when clearly most of them have been incarcerated for the same product that has enriched certain Uh-oh. Sorry, it looks like we lost Tyrone for a moment. On, um, the, he's back. Uh, we lost you for a minute there, Mr. Muhammad. Oh, you did? You lost me? Did you? Did I, I, What did you all hear me? Yeah, Ooh. the last thing you said, the people that were protesting outside are protesting, you know, against. Uh, yes. For opportunity to work in the same industry that has for um, the war on drugs that has destroyed our community of sorts. So these men, we've given opportunity, even with our, um, what we're building now, we have a, what is it, over three acres of greenhouse that we would also teach um, our community how to grow not only uh, the flower, hemp flower, or even cannabis in the future, but the uh, actual growing of cucumbers, tomatoes, fruit, vegetable, flowers, and, and, and the like. So here is what we, where we would like to put our first prototype where we would teach these men business as well as teach them how to grow in our greenhouses. And we've already started this process. We have a partnership with Olive Harvey College. We graduated our first cohort from uh, over, what was it, 16, nine uh, students, students called the Roots to Success, where we teach them environmental literacy and, and all the aspects of what uh, grow, uh, pro propagation and grow and environmental health look like. So that's our first cohort and our partnership with Olive Harvey College um, from ECCSC location. So Charles, you could take it away and talk about uh, to support your local weed man store? Sure. So from a basic nuts and bolts operational perspective, our initial proposed hours uh, will probably be between uh, 11 a.m. to about 10 p.m. Um, that's the plan. Um, what Tyrone mentioned is currently a lot of the products uh, from the flour to some of the other processed products to the edibles and the vapes uh, we are utilizing uh, people that Tyrone has, people who've gone through Tyrone's programs, and they are uh, learning uh, and producing these products. Um, what we want to do is, you know, there's obviously some people who are into the manufacturing and the more functional people, but there are also people who are uh, more outgoing and want to be involved more on the marketing and the sales uh, and all that aspects. So the concept here is to uh, create a storefront uh, under Tyrone's brand and use that as a real way for uh, people who've been affected to uh, put their skills to work in a productive manner versus uh, working in a manner that currently is not uh, you know, legal uh, per the law. Um, what we're proposing initially because uh, cannabis licenses are uh, still uh, tied up in lawsuits, is there are a variety of what's called hemp-derived uh, products, uh, products that uh, such like CBD, other products such as Delta-8 THC, products that uh, offer maybe in some cases similar effects of what you might get with cannabis, but are available and open for smaller businesses and specifically people who have uh, been uh, suffered from the war on drugs 
um, to participate in. So uh, on this corner right now, this is an old picture, but uh, everything in that building at this point outside of the liquor store uh, is closed. So our starting idea would be to uh, set up the store there. Now the store will be more than just call it your local uh, smoke or vape shop. One of the things that we wanna do is we wanna highlight uh, many of the injustices that have occurred uh, and the actual experience that occurs when uh, you know, you, someone might get arrested and sent uh, to prison. So inside that store, if you imagine one side will be the products, but the other side might be more of a museum type uh, experience where we chronicle um, people uh, like Tyrone or other members of ECCSC, what brought them there and then the experiences they have and then their experiences are uh, related to re-entry and uh, getting back in as part of society. So that's a uh, thing. So Mr. Wu, just to, so to be clear, black and white to the point, when I go into this store or if someone goes into this store, one, I can buy products. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. What kind of products uh, would you be selling there? We'll be selling a variety of uh, hemp and hemp derived products to start. So this is sort of like a CBD store, right? Uh, it is a CBD store. Uh, it will also contain a hemp, uh, a hemp product called Delta 8 uh, THC. So Delta 8 is a lighter form of uh, THC that is uh, extracted from hemp and then a variety of other uh, extracted products uh, that one can get from hemp. Okay, and then on the other side of the store is, uh, what is that? Think of it more of kind of, uh, it's like a museum type gallery. There'll be, you know, storyboards, pictures, videos. And one of the things that uh, we plan on putting in is we're gonna put a, a nine by 12 uh, cell so that uh, people who want to experience what it's like to actually sit in a cell um, can do that. And that's gonna be as much of like a challenge or more of like a tourist type attraction um, for people who come visit and want to experience uh, that on that front. Um, and one other question I had and then I, was going to go to the questions I see in the chat. Um, oh, you mentioned vaping. So is is that something that's going to uh, happen there? Well, there won't be consumption at this point indoors because uh, that's just not allowed. Uh, from our understanding of the rules without uh, different types of licensing. We're just looking for more of a traditional retail type of a license. Um, there will be uh, ID checking at the front. Um, we're, we have systems in place where someone will have to scan their ID. We capture that in the database. And then we uh, also uh, cite the right products uh, that, or the products that they buy. So we'll ensure that uh, children cannot buy these products and people under 21 uh, won't be able to do that also. Okay, and there, you know, there's a daycare adjacent to that location. What's... Uh... Well, that daycare, that's an old picture. So that daycare has shut down, but they've moved further down the street at the next building over. So at this point, everything to the uh, left here where you see like smart move furniture and the old daycare. Right now it's, they're empty units. It's a day just west of this location, right? It, it, it is, it's, 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 the, it's the next building over. Okay. Uh, Alderman Dowell, you're muted, so I'm not sure if you were talking. Thank you. Um, from anonymous attendee, thank ECCSC for your work and commitment to community and ex-cons. However, we ask ECCSC to stop putting stickers on public poles and utility boxes. Not only is it illegal, it's opposite of the work many are doing related to beautification and clean streets. Thank you. Um, do you need me to do you need me to respond to that? You can. 
Well, you know, you know, in light of in light of all the violence and the bullet and 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 the and the um, how we put our bodies in front of a lot of the bullets that's being shot out here. I just think that if you're talking about stickers, highlighting um, uh, so, uh, 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 peace, if you look at the stickers, the stickers say, peace, stop the violence. So if that's the problem, I understand. But I just think that mm -hmm. if you focusing on that and not what we do in terms of stopping your sons and daughters and women from being shot and carjacked, I just think all of them that 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 that's rather petty to me, but I accept that criticism, and um, uh, especially in light of all the young men we've been able to take off the streets from doing worse than putting stickers on the on the pole. So thank I, I thank the I thank you for the criticism, and I would be very mindful of that. But um, please There's highlight. There are other questions here. There are other questions here related okay. to your initiative. Um, Guion Foreman, great name, support your local weed man. Another anonymous attendee, Brother Tyrone, we support your story, but are wondering what happens for the non-legal weed man, that's in parentheses, that currently frequents 51st and isn't on board with your desire to educate them. How will you combat that? That's a good question. That's just just, I think just by extension of who we are, and I encourage uh, those listening and watching to, to go to our website, eccsc.org, uh, and look at the work that we've done over the last three, four years. It's there. We have a track record. We have real metrics of, of doing true behavior modification of young men and boys. Uh, that hang on corners, that run the streets. That was one of my main goals in partnering with uh, Mr. Wu is to be able to transform that whole corner, that block, to be able to, with our, what we call our license to operate, for those who don't understand that, that means that the number of men and tied, I have over 2,000 years of prison time associated with my organization of men who get in front of a lot of the violence and the issue that they frontline guys. And with that being said, my goal is to comb that whole area to let these young men know that there's a way to come out the shadows of the, uh, of the, of the uh, illegal activity and be legal. And, and as well as learn product knowledge, because at the end of the day, uh, these young men haven't been offered the opportunity to learn while other people benefit off the very same product that has caused mass incarceration of our men and boys. That's all I will say to that. I example. Right. Yeah, well, right. One thing to add, uh, Elder Mandel, uh, we are very active in not in providing a pathway uh, towards legalization for uh, the non-legal weak person. Um, Tyrone, uh, you know, if you have an off-hand conversation with them, uh, myself, Tyrone, and several others have been working with uh, our local representatives. Uh, Rep. Sonia Harper is one, as an example, and we are trying to ensure uh, over in Springfield that the avenue uh, remains open for uh, all types of people, not just, um, you know, people coming from privilege um, to participate in this industry. So we look at this, we don't want this to come across as, hey, we're going to be competitors and pushing out these, uh, you know, legacy market operators as much as we're setting up a model and a pathway for them to legitimize. And uh, it is our hope that other stores like these were able to uh, populate throughout, uh, you know, the south side of Chicago. And what we're going to be looking for are people in the legacy market because they understand the customers and they understand the market best and provide them a path towards transition and legitimacy so that they can now, uh, similar to how Tyrone says, you know, become part of the solution towards rebuilding the community. Um, I have 
for two people that want to speak, but before we get to them, uh, Deborah Payne, please explain how this will better our community and cure violence, and why would you choose a location steps away from a daycare? Um, and Brian, can you uh, open it up the mic for Saida Johnson? Can you answer that, uh, Mr. Wu and Mr. Muhammad? I thought I thought Mr. Wu answered the daycare aspect, but I, I mean, I just think about the liquor store that's next to our <laughs> vape store. And everything I would say to them is that the gas station sell print plenty of similar products. And um, that's that's really all I say about that. We just offering a different pathway and a more legal pathway and a more transparent pathway of, as to uh, create an opportunity. And as far as violence prevention, that's who we are. And if we are there, I don't expect much of anything um, happening on the corners that we occupy because we represent peace. We represent, represent peace in this city and we are seen as peacemakers in this city. So um, hopefully that can translate um, what it is that we're doing and all the efforts that we will be doing going forward down 51st Street. This is just the beginning of a, of a, a greater initiative of creating businesses and opportunities for uh, our at-risk youth and returning citizens. All right. Um, will the products be grown in the community? That's from Rachel Gatson. So the answer to that initially, um, this is an initial store. So the products are currently being grown in Bridgeview. Um, there's another plan as we get more of these stores up. Uh, Tyrone uh, has his center. And right now the basement of the center is uh, unoccupied. So the hope is we wanted to first build the demand side um, to make sure that if we then put more investment uh, into Tyrone Center, that there will be a consumer base for the products. So the plan right now, they are not grown in the community, but they're grown actually by a lot of uh, former ECCSC members or people that have been helped. And the eventual plan is to then start building the facilities um, in the city. That's the exact address. And then uh, site, Ms. Johnson. Are you unmuted? Hello. Okay. Um, let me get the exact address of the location. Mr. Wu. Oh, sorry. I, I thought I wasn't sure that was. It's 124 East Indiana. Okay. 124 East Indiana. Oh, no, it's 124 East 50. Hello. Right. 54. Yeah, 124 East. Right. First, okay, Ms. Johnson, go ahead. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm the executive director of the preschool, and we have had so many like violent activities that went on on 51st, and it took us over 10 years to kind of try to clean up 51st. We have babies that's on 51st, and we're just now getting a handle on, you know, the traffic, the hanging out, the laudering, the uh, paraphernalia that was up and down the blocks on the streets. I've even had moms and children, you know, that live within the community. They're walking home, and the little baby picking up, you know, cigarette butts or something that's pale familiar, thinking it's candy. And we just want to prevent things like that. We understand and we appreciate all the work that it seemed like Mr. Muhammad has done as far as violent interrupter. Um, I have a lot of respect for that line of work as well. I'm very familiar with it. Um, I have a, a, a husband that works with that. However, I, just do not that smoke shop on 51st is just whew, 
with the gas station and up the street and the liquor store, the parents and the, the children. I just think about the kids. It's, and on 51st, I, I. Thank you, Miss Johnson. I get, yeah. I hear your, your uh, concern. But we need to move on and get some other people. But I do hear what you're saying. I feel what you're saying. Um, thank you. We're gonna. Okay. Um, another couple of comments. Uh, the ex offenders offered a competitive living wage to deter them from restoring to criminal activity. Uh, yes, they are. Okay, we understand and appreciate him helping the community as far as stopping the violence. It's not a good idea to put a CBD shop in our community at this time. There's a need for more uh, time. It's a need more north for the smoke shop. The community wants more restaurants. Okay. Um, Sandra Bivens, can we open up her mic? While we're opening up her mic, uh, here's another comment. Uh, first, peace and blessings. Uh, Minister Malik Harvey, who lives across the street from the proposed location. This is not the right place for this type of business. Having this next to one, a liquor store is not in accordance with what we are trying to do to make a bad combination with those who are working on their growth. So my question is, are we going to place, and he didn't finish it. Yeah, okay. Um, Ms. Bivens? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm Sandra Bivens with the 51st Street Business Association, but you know, I, I First of all, Ms. Muhammad and Mr. Wu, I think what you're talking about is a wonderful ideal and, and everything like that. But let me go back to how we started. We didn't start as a business association. Matter of fact, all of us was individual businesses here on 51st Street. But because of the crime, working with the aldermen, we ended up having to start an association so we can get a handle on things. And this was over 11 years ago. Now, even before 11 years ago, I've worked with uh, Joseph Watkins from Saving Our Seas, Paul McKinney, Mark on the West Side, you know, and I'm still working with uh, Paul with his C3, you know, construction firm and things like that. So believe me, I get, you. I understand. I work with ex-offenders all the time. I work with ex-offenders that spent 60 years in jail and we gave them a job under Saving Our Seas when they got out, you know? So I get what you're doing. My, my thing is that we've done First of all, when you talk about the gas station, let's talk about that gas station. They're under monitoring by BACP with the work we've done with the, with the aldermen and have been willing to close them down and they know. So we, we're still on top of that, even though we ain't, we're not creating miracles, but we're on top of that. The liquor store, these two businesses were grandfathered in, so we couldn't just move them out, but they're under monitored by BACP. So we also are on top of that. 11 years ago, there was killings on 51st and Prairie every single week. But we worked that out, working with the CPA, even working with the brothers on the street because we do have relationships with them as well. And, and today, we don't even see those type of shootings. Not that saying that this doesn't happen because we're a city in Chicago, so we get that. But we don't have those type of shootings that we used to have at least 11 years ago, you know. So we're doing some great work over here and, and we appreciate what you're talking about, but we have changed, we're trying to change the vibe of the neighborhood. And it makes me think about the smoke shop in Hyde Park that they went through, I don't know what with over the last couple of years because it isn't so much that what you do inside, it's also what you do outside. Smoking in, in front of the spot, smoking in the parking lot. You know, there's a lot of things that go on that you have no control of. So we understand that as well. With our daycares and the community that we do have, and we have a lot of senior homes in this area. Many of the residents that I have talked to from the seniors to, to the community residents that own condos, housing, everything, 
just do not feel that this is the time for something like that to be on 51st Street when we worked so hard for 11 years to get to the point where they can walk down the street and even feel comfortable, you know? So I, I'm not saying that we don't applaud the work that you're doing, but everybody seems to feel that there could be other areas that you can do this in other than 51st Street right now, because it might take us back because you can get the license, but we just don't know where it will go tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? And this is what I'm getting from the residents and, and how they feel about this particular situation on this particular strip because we're changing from 55th and all the way down to 47 and all of us are working together, our community groups, our residents, and we feel we've done a very good job in 11 years. No, we're not perfect and we will never sit up here and say we're perfect. But I do think that with the work and the focus that, we on, that mm -hmm. we have to, yes. I just wanted to say that, that the work that we're doing is that that uh, this isn't the time right now for that type of business on this trip. That's what I'm getting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who is the legal owner and who is profiting from this business directly? Uh, oh, I'm 51% owner of this business, Tyrone Muhammad. Okay. Um, and how are you planning to support the community? I think you've discussed uh, the work that your organization does. Well. <laughs> um, lastly, um, the last thing, it would be interesting to see from this is from Anonymous. It would be interesting to see how a business like this pans out for the men and women who will be given an opportunity to have ownership of a cannabis dispensary. Also, how will ownership look once the dispensary opens? Lastly, there is a dispensary on Randolph near Halstead. I'm not sure what the question is here, unless the question is whether or not uh, Tyrone Muhammad, you're going to keep your ownership once the dispensary opens or will we be seeing somebody else on the dispensary? Should I answer that question, Alderman? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm 51% ownership. I didn't get in this business. I'm not learning the business. Um, I'm not watching $2 billion worth of money being made by everybody outside of our communities absent of the men and women who've been affected by the war on drugs. I most definitely plan to keep it and more than 10% to 15% of any resources and revenue coming into our store is going back out. And I guarantee you that's more than the stores and businesses that's giving back to our communities. I guarantee you that's in the area. As far as Miss Sandra Bivens, I most definitely uh, plan to work uh, inside the plan of you. I don't, I, it's not my goal to disrupt that plan because it's much more that we intend to do throughout the uh, community. It's just, it's just that this is the space that the society is at and we're already training and in partnership with several colleges to teach grow, to teach these men that's been most affected by the war on drugs how to benefit and capitalize off the industry that they built. That's all I can say. And I know right. if we, thank you. Okay, we have uh, two other questions and then we have to go on. Who is the 49% owner? I would be the 49% owner. As a sole proprietor? Um, we're structured as a limited liability company. Uh, I have an investment vehicle, uh, so, but I'm the controlling member of the investment. As an group. LLC. Yes. Okay. Uh, last question. Have you surveyed or done a demographic study in Mr. Wu's neighborhood? Is this the only location you have considered? That's from Marilyn Sims. In my personal neighborhood? I, I um, think Mr. Wu's neighborhood, that's what it says. Sure. So uh, outside of this, we are lo opening locations in other places. Um, so the answer is yes. We, we, if, if, if they really need to say 
I think uh, we, we're working to open up in Wicker Park and other surrounding suburbs as well. I want to thank you too for your presentation tonight. Um, I would encourage the community if you have comments about this presentation that you did not make in the Q&A or you have uh, positions in support or in opposition to this uh, business, I would certainly like to hear from you as soon as possible. Um, and I would like to thank Mr. Wu and Mr. Muhammad for their time tonight. Um, if you wanna say anything in closing, you may. Um, and then I'd like to get on to the last item on the agenda. I would, I would, Alderman. I thank you for convening this and everybody that's online as well as the comments. And, and I would like to say that our presence will only increase uh, and reduce violence in the area. If anybody know how we move and how ECC operate, that's why I encourage you all to go to our website, study some of the areas where we, 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 it's a known fact that ECCSE has reduced violence in a number of areas and have provided a number of jobs and opportunity for uh, returning citizens. So um, we are proud of the problem. I mean, the solution, not the problem. We are the change we want to see. We have to do it ourselves sometimes. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, there was one other question in here. Are, are you waiting for approval of a cannabis license from the state? We are not because we are starting with uh, hemp derived cannabinoids. So we're able to move forward. Um, one thing I'd like to add uh, from, you know, again, uh, Alderman Dahl, thank you for uh, letting us use your platform. Um, from my perspective, and ultimately I have to defer to Tyrone, but uh, community engagement and involvement uh, is a critical thing. I don't want to be the person, uh, I don't, not whether me or supporting a person who's just ramming something down, uh, the throat and the neighbors hate us all. So um, from my perspective, I hope we are able to have some follow-up conversations with the people that uh, brought up issues. And I'm gonna have issues moving forward if we're not able to find a way that everyone's happy or we come up with some way that creates a win for everyone on that side. So that's my perspective on things. Well, thank you all. You have a nice evening. Um, our last presentation uh, is a short one, um, five minutes from Yvette Warren from the Quad Communities Development Corporation. Yvette. Good evening. Thank you, Alderman Dow, for allowing us to use your platform this evening to just um, reintroduce QCDC, Quad Communities Development Corporation is the um, community Development Corp for um, the neighborhoods of Grand Boulevard, Oakland, Douglas, and North, Kenwa North Kenwood. Um, it's kind of late in the day. I apologize that <laughs> I'm sort of stumbling. Um, my name is Yvette Warren. I am the Community Engagement Strategist. I know that in the audience, our Executive Director, Rhonda McFarlane, is with me, and Anthony Rogers, our Commercial Retail Strategist, is also on with us. QCDC, as I stated, Quad Communities Development Corporation, is your Neighborhood Business Development Center, Chicago Business Center, and Invest Southwest Corridor Manager um, for our third and fourth awards. And so we are excited that we have benefited from a wonderful partnership with our aldermen. And we are really just wanted to reintroduce ourselves this evening, give you a quick insight into the um, workshops and business um, development services that we offer. Um, we do, we primarily focus on the business community. Our role is to support um, Cliff did a really great verbal illustration earlier about having breakfast at Peaches and then having um, being able to enjoy some of the other businesses, um, maybe go to an art um, gallery and then go and have dinner at Two Fish. Perhaps after that, grabbing some ice cream at Sean Michelle. QCDC is very um, 
we work with those businesses. We are here to support our businesses and to support our local um, economy and ensure that our residents have a great quality of life because they have great businesses in the community. So we are always on the, um, we, we meet with our businesses, we consult with persons who want to open businesses in our community, and we really support our local brick and mortar businesses. So a um, couple of workshops we have coming up. Um, as the Chicago Business Center and Neighborhood Business Development Center, we're doing a pop-up and license workshop on April the 12th. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but I am going to invite you guys to join our mailing list, which is at contact us at qcdc.org. Again, contact us at qcdc.org. We are responsible for Bronzeville Summer Nights and we are looking forward to having a live Bronzeville Summer Nights this year. So July 8th, August the 12th, and September the 9th, we have um, Bronzeville Summer Nights coming up. And so we are looking forward to inviting everybody to come out, support our local businesses. Um, Bronzeville Summer Nights will be along our primary business corridors of 47th Street. 43rd Street and Cottage Grove. If you are a business owner or entrepreneur, we would love to have you join us for some of our workshops. And this is just a little listing of the workshops that we have going on. We will be adding to this this year. We have been in constant contact with our business owners about what their needs are. And we look forward to curating and developing workshops that support those needs. We have a local business directory, shoplocalbronzeville.com. You can find your favorite business listed there. And if you are a business owner, please join. It's for free. Shoplocalbronzeville.com. It's www.shoplocalbronzeville.com. And join our mailing list at contact us at qcdc.org. It is 801 Alderman Dial, and I try to do that in as expeditious manner as possible. But if there are any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them. You are the best. Um, I, I want to just thank you uh, for all the work that QCDC does. Um, I think there are a couple of questions for you in the uh, Q&A. Uh, when are the businesses on 43rd and Cottage going to open, the popcorn place, the wine shop? And the second question is, are your workshops in person or virtual? I'm going to answer the second question first and the first question last because that's the fun question, right? The workshops are both virtual and some will be in person. QCDC never stopped working during COVID. We just pivoted like the rest of the world and we went online. This year we will offer some in-person workshops and we're looking forward to that. Uh, you will be able, once you join our mailing list, you'll be able to get a full listing and we do a newsletter every other week. So all of the resources that we have um, of, available to us, we make sure that all of our local business owners and our community that follows us on our mailing list are able to participate. Our workshops are free. So we do not charge for participating in our workshops. Um, the 4400 Collective, we are excited. Um, as most of you probably are aware, we've had one business that's been open there um, for almost two years now. Um, at least over a year, the time just blurs at this point. But we have three other businesses that will be online before Bronzeville Summer Nights and the remaining of the businesses will be online before the end of this year. Everyone is in construction and we have lots of licensing um, that's gone forward and then some that's still in progress. So we are excited and we're going to all celebrate the 4400 Collective this summer. Thank you very much, Yvonne. 
not Yvette, excuse me, Yvette Warren. Um, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank your executive director, Rhonda McFarland, for me as well. Um, we have come to the end of our town hall meeting tonight. I wanted to thank everyone for showing up and make a correction on something. I said that the next meeting would be on specifically focused on Washington Park. Uh, the next town hall meeting will be focused on the remap. So um, we will have a, a, folk, a meeting specifically on uh, the remap uh, process going on now and uh, how our third ward looks in uh, the two maps that have been proposed um, and some discussion about that. Uh, in closing, I wanna thank uh, everyone who showed up, uh, all of our guests, uh, Chef Rome, I see you still are hanging with us. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone else who have attended this evening. Uh, remember, you can reach us at ward03 at cityofchicago.org, or you can call us at 773-373-9273. I want to acknowledge my staff, Anthony Lindsay here, who I, I see is still with us, and Brian Friedman. And uh, also, I want to acknowledge James Mendez for helping out tonight. You guys have a great evening. Thank you for showing up, and I'll see you next time. Bye.